This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. You may have seen that recently the United States announced a space force. I, 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 guess, I guess that's a thing. Cool, space force. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I can't, why do I laugh a little bit when I hear that? I don't know. But the problem that we're discussing today isn't whether the Space Force is actually going to have military people in space, but rather it's about whether they got their logo from the Star Trek Starfleet Command logo. Here are two examples that I found online. The Space Force one is on the left in this one and on the right in this one. Space Force is... is very similar to the shape and positioning of the Starfleet United Federation of Planets or Starfleet Command logo. And there are variations of these as there are many variations of Star Trek. But I thought we should talk about the doctrine or the law of substantial similarity. What exactly is copyright infringement? How does it apply to this kind of situation? And do we think this is a substantially similar creation to this one? But that's not the entire inquiry. We don't just ask, is this one substantially similar to this one? Or is this one substantially similar to this one? So let's first look at two or three cases and see if we can figure out what, what, what is copyrightable and start to make an inquiry in substantial similarity. Now, disclaimer, substantial similarity has a lot of case law behind it, and it is very, very subjective. Technically, it is an inquiry for a jury or judge as a fact finder. Remember, a judge does not normally act as a fact finder in a jury trial. The jury acts as the fact finder, and the judge applies the law. And there's very few circumstances in which the judge can override the jury. Although it, it, it can happen, it's a very high standard or, or very high bar to meet. So when we talk about copyright substantial similarity, uh, it is an easy cop out for lawyers to say, well, I can't decide it because a jury would have to decide it. Uh, but really what I'm getting at is it is a very long inquiry that involves lots of research. I tried to do research for this today, but unfortunately life gets in the way sometimes. And so we're going to do this with what we've got, and I'll try to dig deeper into it and see what else we can see. But I wanted to think of, I, I thought of two cases. Uh, one I researched or, and, and found, the other one came to mind immediately. We need to know what makes something copyrightable? And I immediately thought of the Feist Rural Telecom case. This is Feist Publications is what it's called. Feist Publications versus Rural Telephone Service Company. We're not actually going to go over all the facts of this case because it's a relatively simple case, but it has an analysis in the middle of what is copyright, and that's what makes it so valuable. This is a 1991 case, and this is between two phone book companies, basically. Respondent, Rural Telephone Service Company, or I'll just call them Rural Telephone, or probably end up calling them Rural Telecom occasionally, is a certified public utility providing telephone service to several communities in Kansas. Pursuant to state regulation, Rural publishes a typical phone directory consisting of white pages and yellow pages. It obtains data for the directory from subscribers who must provide their names and addresses to obtain telephone service. The petitioner or complainant or, or plaintiff is Feist Publications, a publishing company that specializes in area-wide telephone directories covering a much larger geographic range than directories such as Rural's. So Rural's directory is smaller and Feist's is larger, as in contains more information. When Rural refused to license its white pages listings to Feist for a directory covering 11 different telephone service areas, or probably companies, I don't know about 11 different companies, but definitely 11 different areas, Feist extracted the listings it needed from Rural's directory without Rural's consent. 
Although Feist altered many of Rural's listings, several were identical to listings in Rural's white pages. The district court granted summary judgment to Rural on its copyright infringement suit, holding that telephone directories are copyrightable, the Court of Appeals affirmed. We're here now in the Supreme Court, and the holding is that the white pages are not entitled to copyright, and therefore Feist's use of them is not infringement meaning the lower two courts were wrong. So I'm going to skip a little bit here. This was a unanimous opinion delivered by Justice O'Connor, and everyone joined in, and then Justice Blackman wrote his own concurring judgment. Rural Telephone Service Company is subject to a state regulation that requires all telephone companies to issue annually an updated telephone directory as a condition to its monopoly franchise, Rural publishes a typical telephone directory consisting of white and yellow pages. The white pages are alphabetical order and consist of Rural subscribers together with their towns and telephone numbers. If you, if you thought that loss of privacy was a new thing, well, let me introduce you to the phone book. Feist Publications publishes an area-wide telephone directory. Unlike a typical directory, it covers a much larger geographical range, 47,000 white page listings compared to rural 7,700 listings. Rural obtains subscriber information quite easily because it's the provider, the only provider. It has a legal monopoly through the agreement with the uh, Kansas government or, or laws, a uh, public utility commission or something like that. Rural assigns customers a phone number, they have to provide their name and address, and then they put the relevant information into their white pages. Rural refused to license its telephone listings to Feist, so Feist was offering to pay for it, and Rural refused. This created a problem for Feist, as omitting these listings would have left a gaping hole in its area-wide directory, rendering it less attractive to potential Yellow Pages advertisers. In a decision subsequent to what we review here, the district court determined that this was precisely the reason Rural refused to license its listings. The refusal was motivated by an unlawful purpose, to extend its monopoly in telephone services to a monopoly in Yellow Pages advertising. Unable to license Rural's White Pages listings, Feist used them without Rural's consent. They began by removing several thousand listings that fell outside the geographic range of their directory, and then they hired personnel to investigate the remaining 4,935. These verified the data reported by Rural and sought to obtain additional information. As a result, a typical Feist listing includes the individual's street address, whereas Rural's listings do not. However, 1,309 of these listings were identical to Rural's 1982-83 white pages. Four of these were fictitious listings that Rural had inserted into its directory to detect copying. So a kind of watermark is something they, they put in there, and I think that's really clever. I always love that part about this case, that they used four fictitious directory listings as a watermark to know who copied from them. Rural sued for copyright infringement and asserted that Feist employees should be required to travel door to door to conduct a telephone survey instead. Feist responded that such efforts were economically impractical and unnecessary because the information copied was beyond the scope of copyright protection. So we're going to get into what is copyrightable. The district court granted summary judgment. We read, we saw that. Uh, the, the Supreme Court granted certiorari after the appeals court affirmed. This case concerns the interaction of two well-established propositions. Facts are not copyrightable, but compilations of facts generally are. Each of these propositions possesses an impeccable pedigree that there can be no valid copyright in facts is universally understood. The most fundamental axiom of copyright law is that no author may copyright his ideas or facts that he narrates. Rural wisely concedes this point, noting in its brief that facts and discoveries, of course, 
are not themselves subject to copyright protection. At the same time, however, it is beyond dispute that compilations of facts are within the subject matter of copyright. Compilations were expressly mentioned in the Copyright Acts of 1909 and 1976. Now, I understand that the Star Trek logos and the Air Space Force logos are not facts, but we are going to get into a discussion of originality here very shortly. The key question to resolving the tension lies in understanding why facts are not copyrightable. The sine qua non of copyright is its originality. To qualify for copyright protection, a work must be original to the author. Original, as the term is used in copyright, means only that the work was independently created by the author as opposed to copied from other works and that it possesses at least some minimal degree of creativity. To be sure, the requisite level of creativity is extremely low. Even a slight amount will suffice. The vast majority of works make the grade quite easily as they possess some creative spark, no matter how crude, humble, or obvious it might be. So we need some creative spark, no matter how crude, humble, or obvious. Originality does not signify novelty. A work may be original even though it closely resembles other works, so long as the similarity is fortuitous and not the result of copying. To illustrate, assume that two poets, each ignorant of the other, compose identical poems. Neither work is novel, yet both are original and copyrightable. This is a constitutional requirement. The source of copyright's power is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution, which authorizes Congress to secure, for limited times, to authors the exclusive right with respect to their writings. In two decisions from the late 19th century called the Trademark Cases and Borough Giles Lithographic Company v. Cerrone, this court defined the crucial terms authors and writing. In doing so, the court made it unmistakably clear that these terms presuppose a degree of originality. In the trademark cases, the court addressed the constitutional scope of writings. Now, keep in mind, this is a company named Trademark or something like that. I don't know that this is actually involving the you know, 15 USC Trademark Lanham Act kind of thing. For a particular work to be classified under the head of writings of authors, the court determined originality is required. The court explained that originality requires independent creation plus a modicum of creativity. While the word writings may be liberally construed, as it has been, to include original designs for engraving, prints, etc., it is only such as are original and are founded in the creative powers of the mind. The writings which are to be protected are the fruits of intellectual labor embodied in the form of books, prints, engravings, and the like. In Burrow Giles, the court distilled the same requirement from the Constitution's use of the word authors. The court defined author in a constitutional sense to mean he to whom anything owes its origin, the originator or the maker. As in the trademark cases, they emphasized the creative component. It described copyright as being limited to original intellectual conceptions of the author and stressed the importance of requiring an author who accuses another of infringement to prove the existence of those facts of originality, the intellectual production, or the thought and conception. So there would have to be testimony and evidence of how the thing was created and whether it was created by a creative process or whether it was copied from somebody else. It is the very premise of copyright law. So this case stands for that no one may claim originality as to facts, but I'm going to take it one step further by taking us over to a different case. This is Kumar International, a 1981 case versus Russ Berry, and this involves the, uh, the making and selling of teddy bears. Kamar Inc. appeals from a judgment of the district court finding that Kamar's purported copyrights of stuffed toy animals are invalid and not infringed and finding no unfair competition. Both Kamar and Russ Berry sell stuffed toy animals. Kamar's toys are copyrighted as soft sculptures. Um, and this was 1981, I think it was before... No, it would have been after a sculptural copyright, but there was a further copyright act that... Uh, 
worked with architectural works, I believe. The subcontractors take Kamar's designs and make stuffed animals from them, affixing Kamar's copyright notice and distinctive logo to each completed toy. Barry's stuffed animals are also copyrighted, but Barry purchases them directly from Korean manufacturers. Three of Barry's Korean manufacturers were previously employed by Kamar to manufacture Kamar's stuffed animals. So that might be access. That's part of copyright infringement. We'll see in a moment. The copyrightability of stuffed animals. This court has said that the prerequisites for copyright registration are minimal. The work offered for registration need not be new, but only original, the product of the registrant. Original in reference to a copyright work means the particular work owes its origin to the author. No large measure of novelty is required. All that is needed to satisfy both the Constitution and the statute is that the author contributed something more than a merely trivial variation, recognizably his own work. Barry contends that because stuffed toy animals are widely available to manufacturers like himself, and that because Kamar's concepts of toy animals were taken from the public domain, that his stuffed animals are not copyrightable. The district judge agreed and adopted Barry's proposed findings to that effect. In order to support its finding that the animals were not copyrightable, the court would have had to find that Kamar's stuffed animals lack originality. Nowhere, however, is the word originality used by either Barry or the trial court. There's no factual findings denying that they're original. The question does not even appear to have been addressed. This omission seems unusual in the view of the truism that originality is the sine qua non of copyrightability. All we have are two factual findings by the court, one of which says that presumably all stuffed animals are in the public domain. The other says that Kamar's toys were taken from the public domain. So such findings do not establish lack of originality. The mere fact that plaintiff used a matter in the public domain does not in and of itself preclude a finding of originality since plaintiff may have added unique features to the matter so as to render it copyrightable. Therefore, without a finding of lack of originality, the trial court could not conclude that Kamar's soft sculptures were not copyrightable because Kamar's concept toy animals was taken from the public domain. Barry makes a novel contention that realistic depictions of live animals are not copyrightable. The district court agreed and instructed Barry to prepare findings to that effect. These findings are conclusions and they are erroneous. We find no authority for Barry's proposition. Anyone can copyright anything if he adds something original to its expression. The cases cited by Barry and the court below to the contrary are not in point. Indeed, the very contention urged has been expressly rejected. The mere fact that a stuffed toy chimp is based on a live model does not deprive him of the necessary amount of originality. Kumar's copyright cannot be invalidated on that ground. The court failed to find similarity between the, the stuffed toy animals. The court used too strict of a test. The test in this circuit for substantial similarity is the two-part test propounded in Sid and Marty Croft television, and Professor Nimmer, who is a famous writer of copyright, copyright treatises or copyright summaries, uh, so correctly states it as follows. Under Croft, there are two steps to the analytic process. First, there is the issue of whether there is substantial similarity as to the general ideas contained in the two works. So when we look at the Star Trek versus Space Force logos, think of, is there substantial similarity as to the general ideas contained in the two works? This is to be resolved by what Croft labels the extrinsic test, in that this determination turns not on the responses of the trier of fact, but on specific criteria that can be listed and analyzed. These criteria are said to include not only the subject matter, the setting for the subject, which do go to the issue of similarity, but also to the type of artwork involved, the materials used. So we want the type of artwork the materials used, the subject matter, and the setting. In applying the extrinsic test, the Croft Court concluded that analytic dissection and expert testimony are appropriate. Having found such idea similarity, the second step in the analytic process requires the trier of fact then to decide whether there is substantial similarity in the expressions of the ideas. This is to be determined by what Croft labels the intrinsic test, in that it depends on the response of an ordinary reasonable person. In applying the intrinsic test, analytic dissection, and 
expert testimony are not appropriate. The court made no mention of Croft and nowhere does it employ the two-part test. And so they're going to re-examine that. So then we're going to stop with that analysis there and go back over to the Space Force versus Starfleet Command issue. And we're going to do it in the context of the the extrinsic and intrinsic tests. So if we think of the extrinsic test, these criteria are said to include the subject matter, the setting for the subject, the type of artwork involved, and the materials used. And this is where analytic dissection and expert testimony are appropriate. So let's think of analytic dissection and expert testimony, the setting, etc. So first, I would point out that there are certain parts of these logos that are not going to be copyright protectable, as in copyright only protects novel creations, not creations that remember things like Senna Fair and the general shape of logos. Some things are not protectable. So a uh, movie scene or story being set at two people on a bench in a park, just that without more is not something that's copyright protected. The first person who made a story about two people on a bench in a park or two people fall in love, but their parents don't like it. Uh, th though that's not enough to be copyright protected. It is more like the actual plot and, and facts, uh, or rather not facts, rather the, the plot and the creativity in creating Romeo and Juliet, not two people fall in love and their, you know, collective families don't like it. Or two people sit on a bench in a park and discuss something is not enough to be an exclusive copyright. So here in these logos, I'm going to first say that we've got to sort of get away from the fact that it's a round patch style logo. Lots and lots of, of government entities and things are in a round shape. So the overall, just the fact that they're round to me doesn't mean anything and that itself is not creative or not. Um, but well, here's what I do see. I do see the text around the inside, which one says United States Space Force, the other says United Federation of Planets, uh, one says Department of the Air Force, the other says Starfleet Command. Those are those things are different to me, um, and if that was something that was exactly copied, if the United States decided to call their Space Force Starfleet Command. I would be much more on the side of CBS, Star Trek, whoever whoever owns all the intellectual property there. The fact that they have an inner border between the lettering and then the graphical design, that doesn't really mean much to me. In fact, I see differences here. I see that Starfleet Command's logo here and less so here, but Starfleet Command's logo has sort of an extra stroke or extra border, a, a, a medium blue border on the outside. And then for the inside border, there is a dark blue, then white, then back to medium blue, sort of three stroke border going around there. Whereas the Space Force is just a, uh, it's just a, a, a solid white stroke. Then in between them, the uh, Starfleet has these uh, Caltrop or, or what was that game where you used to put a, a bounce a ball and then you had to collect all the, the things that were shaped like this. I remember what that was called. Jacks. Jacks. Okay. So the, these Jacks shaped stars, whereas the space force has this, uh, uh, what is this diamond or, or Vanguard shaped, uh, icon. Then on the inside, the sort of sort of background of the graphical part of the logo, the Space Force one has clusters of dots with a sort of uh, eight pointed star and four pointed star going vertically here and here, and then a bunch of dots and maybe a maybe a four pointed star here. And the Starfleet Command logo has different clusters of dots more prominent four-point stars 
and still has about three of them. So it is three four point stars in each of them. But the the dots representing what I'm assuming are stars, of course, because it's supposed to be space, right? So these these stars or whatever are much more prominent in the Starfleet Command logo. Uh, similar over here, no four point stars, no eight point stars, but uh, definitely a bunch of dots representing stars. Then you have a world logo in the background. Uh, I'm assuming this is a planet. This is probably planet Earth, but you know, I'm just assuming because what else would it be? It's the Space Force. They, they're not going to Mars, and Mars is certainly not a blue planet anyway. We're the blue planet, so that's probably Earth. And it has latitude and longitude lines on it. And there's no there's no planet logo as part of the, or planet graphic as part of the Starfleet Command logo. And then you've got this, this kind of swoosh in orbit around the planet, the Space Force logo has the swoosh more or less in a proper orbit, whereas the Starfleet Command has something definitely similar, a, a swoosh or, or line orbiting their central diamond vanguard shaped thing, which we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but this is more of an escape velocity orbit, and it does gradient or or diminish in size, a decrescendo almost, um, from behind the logo off to the left, and then in front of the logo or in front of the graphic and back to the right, as it, it, it seems to be escaping the, uh, the velocity, you know, escaping the orbit of whatever it's orbiting. Similar here, this other Starfleet Command logo uh, swooshes all the way over into the outer ring of the 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 entire work. And then the part that I think is really, really similar, at least in total concept and feel when we think of it, is that there's a sort of arrow-shaped central graphic. The one from Starfleet is a very iconic Starfleet command di- uh, arrow that has an off-center cut in the bottom instead of an equidistant cut like in Space Force. It is sort of a, a bicolor illustration. It has a two-stroke uh, border around the outside of it. Similarly, there's at least a kind of stroke around this graphic, but it's the similar arrow shape, but with this off-center cutout on the bottom, whereas the Space Force one is more uh, shaded. It's a, it's a four-color shading that seems to make it appear three-dimensional. The Starfleet Command logo doesn't appear so much three-dimensional. And these four shading polygons are very much um, uniform and creating a the lines right down the center here and and they're they're equidistant so it's very much uh, very centered and and proper as opposed to starfleets which is off centered uh, on purpose and then there's the uh, 2019 in roman numerals at the bottom of the space force so looking at that those are the what i would consider just just quickly in in my opinion Those are the things that are the same and different about the two logos. And then what Kamar and other cases, or rather Sid and Marty Croft Television says, is that we need to do an intrinsic test, which is the response of an ordinary reasonable person without analytic dissection and expert testimony. Now, what I'm a little unclear on is is how the courts reconcile those two tests. So let me go back over here to substantial similarity. If there is a substantial similarity of ideas, then the trier of fact must determine whether there is substantial similarity in the expressions. So then if we have crossed the line from substantial similarity of ideas, then we have to figure out whether there's substantial similarity of expressions. So here is your first question then. Is there substantial, so not just similarity, there's obviously to me similarity. But is there substantial similarity in the ideas here? They're in two different settings, in my humble opinion. The Space Force is a logo for an actual Space Force, whereas Starfleet Command's logo is for a fictional space 
entity. But yeah, there's some kind of similarity. So does it reach your level of similarity of ideas? And try to be unbiased as much as you can. And then if it does reach substantial similarity of ideas, then we have to ask a jury whether it is substantially similar in expression. And this is where I might make some enemies. So feel free to disagree with me, but try to understand this is a this is a debate question, not a life and death question. I think they are not substantially similar. I think this uses a different font in the Space Force. It uses a different arrow. It has a world with an, a proper orbit, whereas there's no world in Starfleet, and this swoosh is completely different. It's even a different color. The, the swoosh on the Starfleet ends at one of the stars. Maybe it's even like somebody going to warp, whereas the Space Force has what looks like uh, the body of of a space vessel or some kind of entity here, but uh, it, it seems to be continuing in its orbit, not escaping. So while I definitely agree they are similar, I do not think that they are substantially similar. I do not think that they are copyright infringement. Uh, I don't think the Space Force logo is copyright infringement of the Starfleet Command logo. I think that it was modeled after it and I think that you could get testimony as to whether it was directly copied, but I think that they also took the concept of a Space Force uh, logo from Starfleet's logo and then made their own in the same spirit, but not enough to be copyright infringement. So then compare that to this. This is the Air Force Space Command logo, which looks a whole lot more like the Space Force logo than even I thought it did. It's got four pointed stars, although they look more like uh, Christian crosses than they do uh, pure four point stars. But it has this, this, this proper orbit, at least it's got two, but there's, uh, but there's, there's only one in the Space Force logo. I like that it has the moon here. I think that's really cool. And it has the exact same uh, four polygon arrow shape in the center. So now that doesn't automatically torpedo this in, this copyright infringement argument. Starfleet Command's logo, at least maybe this version of it, I don't know which one came when, but, th but Star Trek uh, definitely uh, existed before 1980 something for the Space Force or Air Force logo. Yeah, this was 1982, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Star Trek, it was at least 1966, um, and I don't see the logo, so I couldn't tell you when that logo was created. That would be part of it. If there was a lawsuit from whoever owns the original series or owns those logos, they would definitely be comparing when and how they were created. So it's a really interesting question, and I, I really love it, like from a copyright academia and education point of view. And I could probably find, with, with much more time to do my research, I could probably find better cases on point. But my point today was to, was to point out, how, can, how many times can you say point in, in, in a couple sentences? That there are parts of these that are original, and there are parts of these that are sin affair or non-novel or public domain. And so no one's going to be able to establish copyright substantial similarity just based on the fact that the, both logos are round or both logos have text uh, around the outside, uh, outside of the, the inner border um, or that both logos have stars in the background. Th th those things all by themselves are not copyright protected. It is the combination of it all into a finished work. And then we compare the finished works. And so if you agree that this is copyright infringement, let us know, if you can, why you think that they are the same, not just, well, I feel like they are the same, which is a fine thing to, it's a very human thing to feel away about things. It's different to be able to articulate it in some kind of proof. And 
we're lay people here on YouTube and all that, so I'm not expecting you to create a legal proof with citations and all that, but rather, what do you see in these logos that is so similar that it is copyright substantial similarity and is some kind of infringement? Likewise, if you agree that it is not copyright infringement, what is it that you think makes it not copyright infringement? That they're just not similar enough that, as I explained with it, with going through the different pieces of it, that there's enough different, is it something specific? The, the arrow shape of the Space Force versus the badge shape of the Starfleet Command logo. I, I totally forgot to even go into the starship shaped star here, this five pointed star with the elongated tip that looks like it could be a starship or maybe a, a star that's or something visual that is being twisted or warped literally from warp. I'm not sure where that exactly comes from, but there's no no there's nothing in the Space Force logo that copies the five point this five pointed star. In fact, there isn't even a five pointed star in the Space Force logo. They're all four point stars and there's an eight point star up here. Uh, the only thing that I'd like to see added to the Space Force logo is maybe a moon cuz, you know, moon of course, maybe they're also maybe this maybe this sperm shaped thing is supposed to be the moon. I doubt it. That's that's gonna that's a vehicle. That's some kind of vehicle that's orbiting. That's that's the the military space force vessel is orbiting there. I think that's what that is. Let, let's also consider the purposes here. Um, not that this comes into copyright substantial similarity, but rather just the ideas of what is copyright protecting. It's cre it's protecting the the creativity of an author's work. Is an author's work really being stolen here? I, I don't think so. I think that the author of the Space Force logo may have been inspired by the Starfleet Command logo, but there is nothing wrong with being inspired by something and then making your own creation that you do your best to avoid substantial similarity, copyright infringement. People make new artwork all the time that is inspired by old artwork or other artwork, and there is nothing wrong with that. It's when you have access to the original work and you copy from the original work, and that copy is substantially similar. So if we think this is substantial similarity, then yeah, this is some kind of copyright infringement, but I, I don't see this reaching the level needed for substantial similarity. And then what I also wanted to go into is I don't think anyone's going to see a logo clearly labeled United Space States, United States Space Force and think, oh, that's from Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek. Um, inspired by maybe but i don't i don't know that that's going to be confusing so I, I don't i don't know that i see a trademark issue here that would be the standard for trademark would be confusing similarity in a marketplace plus they're for two different things one's for a fictional uh, production and one is for an actual military organization but the military organization of course will be selling t-shirts and people other it will reach the stream of commerce i am sure but I don't think if you saw these two things, one of which is clearly labeled Space Force and one of which is labeled Starfleet Command, I don't think you're going to be finding too many consumers, especially reasonable consumers, who see the two logos and can't distinguish which one's the Space Force and which one's Starfleet Command. It literally says it. I mean, that's... You'd, you'd have to you'd have to maybe take the outer border the 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 whole outer ring out and then just look at the two of them maybe that could be a little bit confusing somebody could think that without the the text ring around the outside maybe someone who doesn't know might say oh i wonder if that's a new star trek logo but that's not the standard for copyright infringement that's the standard for trademark so if you have a trademark argument make that one below as well so that's a good one. I really like that one. And if I have anything to add by the time we go to production, I'll see if I can uh, I can add that in there. But that's our show, everyone. Thanks for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you to our February supporters on patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsus.com slash law. 
We really appreciate your support. Your financial support for the month of February is what keeps our channel going and growing and keeps us able to bring these videos to you on new and upcoming topics of law. So thank you very much. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I will see you in the videos that drop. Have a great one. Love you all. Bye.